Hello everyone, welcome to the residence uh, training in study design biostatistics. So today I'm going to talk about the statistics nuts and bolts, uh, specifically the data types, the variable types, and the summary statistics. So my name is Nan Hu, I'm a faculty member in the Department of Internal Medicine. Here are the objectives of the, uh, uh, the session. First of all, we want you to distinguish between continuous, categorical, and other type of variables. Secondly, you need to recognize how these data types arise from measurements and classifications. Last, be familiar with the ways of describing and summarizing data that suit each type of the data. Here's the overview of the talk today. First of all, we will talk about the measurements. So what is a measurement? And what is the observation? Uh, followed by the type of measurements. At the end, we will introduce the way to describe data. First of all, you need to know the observations. So what is observations? An observation is the value at the particular period of a particular variable. So this is a definition based on the OECD.org uh, website, and they have the glossary. So the example of observations including blood pressure of an individual, or one of a number of pressures collected for a study cohort. Then we will talk about the types of measurements. So data that measured have a specific structure, and this data may include the following types. First of all, is the continuous data or continuous variable. And then it's binary data or binary variable, ordinal data, nominal data, count data, and time to event data. Continuous variables may take any value from negative infinity to positive infinity. Examples including age and years, blood pressure, and time in hours. Binary variable are generated when a characteristic can have only one or two conditions or status. Examples including disease status. For, for example, we can use zero to represent not diseased, one to denote diseased. And mortality status, zero for alive and one for deceased. Ordinal variables can take only integer values or the whole numbers. So values are ordered in ordinal variables. So examples including the level of pain. You can name the pain level from 1 to 10, but only in integer, for example, 1 or 2 or 3 or 6 or 10. And Likert scale variables, so these are usually used in survey uh, for example, you can use 5 to represent strongly agree, 4 for agree, 3 for neutral, 2 for disagree, and 1 for strongly disagree. Nominal variables, so concepts that make that a limited number of categories, and the categories are not ordered, but numbers are used to represent the categories in a data set. So examples including marital status, so for example, you can use one to represent individuals currently single, two for currently married, not separate, and three for currently married but separate. Or smoking status, you can use one to denote current smoker, two for formal smoker, not smoking currently, and three for never smoker. Or gender, usually we use zero to represent male and one for female. So examples include marital status. For example, we can use one to denote those patients currently single and two for currently single, currently married, not separate, and three for currently married, but separate. Or smoking status, we can use one to represent the patients who is currently smoker, and two for a formal smoker, 
not smoking currently, and three for never smoker. What gender, you really will use zero to denote male and one for female. Count data. Values will, pop, will be positive and taking integers or whole numbers. Examples including the number of HIV infections in the state of Utah in year 2016. And lastly, the time to event data. So time to event data usually with a positive continuous time variable indicating time to the event of interest together with a binary indicator variable indicating if the time is the event or the censoring time. The so censoring time including the time of loss of follow-up or the time at end of the study. Example including the time to death among patients diagnosed with anaplastic oligodendroglioma, which is patient may drop off the study before death or may be still alive until the end of the study. Then we will talk about the description of data. First of all, we'll talk about the visual display of the data. First of all, we want to talk about the histogram. Usually, histogram provides nearly complete picture of variables of a sample of values. And the histogram divides abscessa into equally spaced intervals and record the number of measurements within each interval as a bar in terms of either frequency or proportion. The histogram for frequency, so usually the frequency of individual falling in any range, what we call the bin, is the count of individuals in the range. In terms of proportion, the proportion of individuals falling in any range or bin is the fraction of total area covered by the bars. Histogram may be used for many data types, for example, for continuous data, count data, ordinal data, or binary data. Here are two examples of histograms. On the left-hand side, this is the histogram of the frequency. On the right-hand side is the histogram in terms of proportion. Secondly, we can use the frequency distribution to visually display the data. The frequency distribution, sometimes we call density distribution, is idealized histogram one could construct if could sample the whole entire population. Here is one example of the Gaussian or normal distribution density curve. So this curve shows the whole range of the data and the possible range can go from negative infinity to positive infinity because this is for a continuous variable and also this distribution shows the frequency for example at the mean the frequency will be the maximum and also show at the points for mean, plus or minus, certain number of standard deviation represented by sigma right there. So if you get the point and you make a line and one the line meets the frequency curve you get the frequency corresponding to that specific point. And then this curve also show the 95% areas within the limits is about from the mean minus two times standard deviation to mean plus two times of the standard deviation. And if we go to mean minus three standard deviation to mean plus three standard deviation and that will cover 99.7% of the population 
within each limit. Secondly, we can use summary statistics to describe the data. When statistics are based on sample, they are often called sample statistics. The corresponding true value of statistics as if the entire population could be sampled is called a population statistic or parameter. Sample statistics are used to estimate or make inferences about the population parameter. The description of the data in terms of summary statistics will depend upon the type of data. The continuous variables, so the way we summarize them is in terms of the central tendency and the dispersion or spread of the data. So measurement of central tendency is often called a location parameter in statistics. So this including mean, which is the arithmetic average of all the data, or median, which is the middle number in ordered sequence of a sample data. So a simple example is if your data including only three data points, one or two or three, the median will be two because two is in the middle point of the whole sequence. Or if your data have four points, one or two or three and four, then the median will be in the middle of two and three, that is 2.5 in that situation. The median is defined as the 50th percentile of the measurements. Lastly, we can use geometric mean. The geometric mean is the nth root of product of values. So this is equivalent to anti-log of the mean of logs and useful for log transform data. So usually if we have a skew data, but if we want to transform to a data with a better normality, we usually do using a log transformation. And this is useful for log transform data to use geometric mean. Second, we can summarize the spread or the dispersion. The first parameter we can use is called the variance. The variance is the average squared deviation of values from the mean. The second parameter is called standard deviation. This is nothing more than just the square root of the variance. The third one is called interquartile range. This is the range covering the middle 50% of the data. So basically this is from the first quartile to the third quartile of the data. So it automatically covered the 50%, but 50% in the middle distribution of the data. Other measurements including coefficient of variation. So this is a derived parameter using a standard deviation divided by the mean of the data. So this is a positive unimodal distribution usually with a standard coefficient of variation greater than 0.5, often skewed to the right. The second parameter is called skewness, which is a measure of asymmetry. And the last one is called kurtosis, which is a, a measure of the long tailness of the distribution. Often, in a research paper, we can put in table one the summary statistics and this table usually report mean standard deviation for continuous variable that approximately normally distributed or just normally distributed and we can report median and interquartile range for continuous variable with a skewed distribution The summary statistic for binary and the categorical variable in table one, usually we just report the frequency and the percent in each category of these variables. Specifically for binary variable, 
we can only just to report the frequency and the proportion of one categories if the total sample size is also provided. So for example, if we have male and female in the study, and if we report this whole study sample size, we can just report the frequency of male and the proportion of male. And people can just automatically calculate the frequency and the proportion for female. For cam data, cam data is often skewed. If the number of possible cam is not large, we can report cam variable the same way as the categorical variables. So that is, we can report the frequency and the proportion in each category of count data. Sometimes the possible number of counts is large. In that situation, we can just show the distribution and report the mode, which is the value that appears most frequently within a set of the measurements. In terms of the description of time to event data, first of all, we can summarize the data using a life table. The life table will give us the number of patients at risk and number of patients with the event of interest and proportion of survival and cumulative proportion of survival within each time interval. So basically, first of all, we can divide the whole time of follow-up period into a different time interval. In this example, they just divide them into from 0 to 1 month, greater than 1 to 6 months, 6 months to 12, 12 months, 12 to 24, etc. And then within each of the time interval, we can calculate the number of patients at risk, the number of patients with event of interest, so in this example, it's death. And then we can calculate the proportion of survival within each time period. For example, for the time, first period from zero to one month, we start with 76 patients at risk. And four of them died at the end of the study, at the end of the time period. And therefore, the proportion of survival is equal to 100% minus the proportion of event. And the proportion of event can be easily calculated using the number of patients with the event and the total number of patients at risk. So in this example, that is equal to 4 divided by 76. So this is about 4 or 5 or 6 percent. And therefore, the proportion of survival is equal to 1 minus 5 or 6 percent. So it's about 95 94 percent. And then for the second time period, we start with 72 patients under risk. This 72 is equal to 76 minus 4 because 4 among the 76 patients died in the previous period in the previous period. And therefore the number at risk is 72. And because there's a zero death during this time period, the event rate will be zero divided by 72, which is 0%. And therefore, the proportion of survival within this time interval is one or 100%. And if we use 100% times the previous proportion of cumulative survival, and we got the cumulative survival at the end of this time period. So that's equal to 1 times this 0.95, which is 0.95. And this 0.95 
is the proportion of cumulative survival at end of month six. And this 100% is the proportion of survival within the time period from one to six months. So similarly, we can calculate the proportion of survival within each time period. And also we can calculate the proportion of cumulative survival after each time period. And we end up with 21% at the end of the study period as the cumulative survival proportion. The second way to summarize a ton to event data is use the Kaplan-Meier curves or Kaplan-Meier survival functions. So here is one example of the Kaplan-Meier curve. So this is a two-arm study comparing the survival of two types of patients. So one group of patients with gene A signature and the other group of patients with gene B signature. And the green line shows the whole survival curve within the time of study period for the gene A signature group. And the right lines represent the whole Kaplan-Meier survival curve for the group with gene B signature during the study period. And then this is a good way to visually compare the survival of the two arms at any single time point within the study period. So for example, at year one, you can estimate this is the survival proportion for gene B signature group. And this is the survival proportion for gene A signature group. Similarly, at year three, you can also draw a vertical line, and when the vertical line meets the curve, you can make a horizontal line. So which give you the proportion of survival for each of the corresponding arm within the study. Lastly, I want to show one real data example and show how we can summarize the data. So this example data is called the milk of the cow. So in this example, the milk was collected weekly from 79 Australian cows and analyzed for protein contents. Each of the cows were maintained on one of the three dyes. So one dye is called barley, the other is lupins, the third one is a mixture of barley and lupins. The data set of the study contains four variables and therefore it's a very straightforward data set. The first variable is called diet. So this is the indicator of the kind of diet of the cow. And then second variable is the cow ID. This is really the ID number of the individual cows because we have a total of 79 cows in the study and therefore the ID number will be from one to 79. And the third one is the week. The week indicate the number of weeks since the baseline. So the baseline is the time these cows were given a different type of diet. And therefore the weeks will be a count variable indicating the number of weeks because it's only in you only take integers. This is either a count variable, or you can consider it as a categorical variable. The last one is the protein level. The protein level in the milk output from the individual cow is measured. And this is a continuous variable because it can take any value within the range of the protein level. So here is a data set in Stata. So I'm going to enlarge it so you can see better the structure and the variable. So we have this diet variable. We have the cow ID as the second one. And then we have the week variable. 
and then we have the protein, which is a continuous variable. So this portion of the data show you there are both type of diet. There's a diet 1 and there's a diet 2. And we have this cow ID number. So within each cow ID number, there's going to be a multiple protein levels which correspond to each week of the measurements. Then we can go to the summary. So here is the proposal for the summary for each of the variables in the data set. So for diet, this is a categorical variable and this is a nominal variable and therefore we can do the proportion and the frequency. For week, this is categorical variable, where you can also think that's a count variable, and they take value from 1 to 19. But some cows may miss measurement for some weeks due to the missing data. And protein is a continuous variable, and therefore we can summarize it using mean and standard deviation if we make sure the distribution is normal or approximately normal. Here's the summary of the diet variable. As I said, for this kind of variable, because there's only three categories, so we can just summarize the frequency and the percent within each type of the variables. But make sure within the diet variable, each of the number represent one type of the diet. There's no numerical meaning for the diet variable. So for example, one represent the barley, two represent lupins, and three represent the mixture of the two. Okay. And then for the weak variable, you can think that's a categorical variable, or you can think that's a count variable with a limited number of categories. The possible number is from one to 19. And therefore, you can summarize them similarly. So for each week, you can summarize the frequency. So this is basically the number of cows who have measurements for each of the corresponding weeks. So for example, the week one, we can record 79 cows. And at week two, we can record 78 because of missed measurements of one of the cows. And therefore, you can summarize them for each of the week all together. As you can see, we have less and less cows at a later time because we have the missing data. And corresponding to each frequency, you can also summarize the proportion or the percent. So this is similar to the summary of the diet variable. Lastly, we can summarize the protein level. And one way to do is we summarize the protein level at week one. Because we have the protein measurements over week one to 19, and there's not meaningful to pull all this data together. And therefore, summary at week one will be the best because week one, we have a total number of 79 measurements. There's going to be no missing data at the baseline or week one. In terms of summary, the protein level is approximately normal, and therefore we can report the mean and the standard deviation. So this is usually the way in table one. So the observation is the number of observations or called sample size. Sometimes people just use n. So 79 means this summary is based on 79 cows. So total number of observations is 79. And this is given by the observation column. And sometimes people use n to represent the sample size. And the mean of the whole protein level is 3.83. The standard deviation is 0.401. And the mean and the maximum will give you the range of the data. So at week one, the minimum protein level is 2.69.
and the maximum of the protein level is 4.59. Lastly, we can look at the distribution of the protein level because the protein level is a continuous variable. And here it shows the histogram. So as I said, the histogram give you the frequency, what sometimes people call the density, which is the same as the proportion. So basically, this is just the proportion of number of cows with the protein level for in the range of each of these beans. So when we put all these beans together, this is the histogram for the protein level at week one. And we can see the distribution is normally or approximately normally distributed. And sometimes people do things called smoothing. So when you do the smoothing on the histogram, it will show you an estimated curve that best describe the shape of this density function. Something like this. But this bars is called the raw histogram. And this will not give you the estimated curve, but only show you the proportion of protein level for in each of these bins or categories. This is everything about the type of data measurements and summary statistics. I will see you next time.